It was a conflict that stretched four years. It began in April, and that same month, four years later, so began the beginning of the end. In many wars before and since, winning the war was only half the challenge, for then victors had to win the peace. And winning the peace after a civil war presented an ominous set of issues. Indeed, history has shown us that in the French, Russian, and Chinese revolutions, once the fighting ended, then came the bloodbaths. That did not happen here, and in large part we owe that to Abraham Lincoln and to two warriors who made peace not just for that current generation, but for countless others in the future. This is the story of Ulysses S. Grant and Robert E. Lee, who amidst the stillness of Appomattox had their finest hour. The last five letters of history spell story, and that's exactly how history should be taught. Numbers and dates have no soul. Such presentations fall flat, for history is alive and relevant. Welcome to Threads from the National Tapestry, stories from the American Civil War. This series will feature events and people from that period and will strive to make you feel as if you were there, to show that history is indeed a story. Robert E. Lee, Ulysses S. Grant, two timeless men in a moment when time stood still. One five foot ten inches from the mystic dirt of Virginia, who on April the 9th, 1865, would be the one who would surrender. The other, the five eight native of Ohio, would dictate the terms. Though both were under six feet, the two were and remain giants. Each lived to be 63 years of age. For all their exploits, they went head to head for 11 months and met face to face only four times. In April of 1865, their armies had been locked in siege warfare for the last 10 months. Since the siege of Petersburg began in mid-June of 1864, Grant ordered Major General George Gordon Meade, commander of the Army of the Potomac, to extend his lines to the south and southwest. Lee had to do the same, all the while dangerously stretching his already thin lines and men. The climax came April the 1st, when Lee's right was turned at Five Forks. Then, the next day brought breakthrough and the final chase began. After months of entrenchment, now it was a running battle across southern central Virginia. On April the 7th, a remarkable series of messages began between Grant and Lee. The first, at 5 p.m. on Friday that day, came from Grant's pen. Addressed to General R. E. Lee, it read, the results of the last week must convince you of the hopelessness of further resistance on that part of the Army of Northern Virginia in this struggle. I feel it is so, and regard it as my duty to shift for myself the responsibility of any further effusion of blood by asking of you the surrender of that portion of the Confederate States Army known as the Army of Northern Virginia. That note prompted several communications between the two. Both commanders exchanged carefully constructed messages that were essentially a series of military and diplomatic thrusts and parries. On Sunday the 9th, Grant responded to a message from Lee that was written the day before, written by a man who, despite reality, refused to accept defeat. In Grant's message dated April the 9th, the Union General-in-Chief hoped that all difficulties may be settled without the loss of another life. Military events dictated Lee's response when the Georgian, Major General John B. Gordon, brought in news that the road to Lynchburg was blocked by Union cavalry. Ordered to push them aside, Gordon later returned to inform his general that his orders had been carried out, but behind the blue steel of Union infantry. Around 8 a.m., a courier from Gordon raced in, and to Lee handed this message. I have fought my corps to a frazzle, and I fear I can do nothing more. Seeking advice, the commanding general of the Army of Northern Virginia called on James Longstreet, who led his first corps. With Longstreet, when Lee arrived, was Major General William Mahone, 
and the Army's Chief of Artillery, 29-year-old Brigadier General E.P. Alexander. The word surrender came up, and after a silence that roared, it was Alexander who spoke up. He suggested something that would have made Abraham Lincoln, U.S. Grant, and William Sherman collectively shudder. Let the men take to the woods, disappear into the hills, become guerrillas. With every eye in the room on Lee, he paused, weighing his answer, then carefully said, Suppose I should take your suggestion. The men would be without rations and under no control of officers. They would be compelled to rob and steal in order to live. They would become bands of marauders, and the enemy's cavalry would overrun many sections that may never have occasion to visit. No, we would bring on a state of affairs it would take the country years to recover from. No, to Lee, the Almighty had dictated the outcome, and now it was time to lay it all down. With that decision, as author J. Winnick wrote in his 2001 work, April 1865, The Month That Saved America, the man of war made his greatest and most historic decision. It was one for peace, one for laying down arms, one to send men home to be husbands, fathers, and sons, to be American citizens once again. For Robert E. Lee, that decision was not an easy one. No matter how great a leader he was, he was also quite human. He wrestled with the inner turmoil. It was just that morning that as he started off into early morning fog, he cried out, How easily I could be rid of all this and be at rest. I have only to ride along the line and all will be over. Resolved to surrender, the chase over. Lee reportedly said, I guess that means I must see General Grant and I would rather die a thousand deaths. A resigned Robert E. Lee wrote, General, I received your note of this morning on the picket line, whither I had come to meet you and ascertain definitely what terms were embraced in your proposal of yesterday with reference to the surrender of this army. I now request an interview in accordance with the offer contained in your letter of yesterday for that purpose. When news of Lee's message spread, a Union artillery officer jumped atop a caisson and proposed three cheers. When all with him began to understand what it meant, after months and years of campaign, combat, and casualties, yes, when they remembered the strange fraternity created by battling a worthy opponent and wondered what each would do after a lifetime of experiences amassed over the course of the last four years, the cheering stopped and grown men tumbled into tears. Now it was Grant's turn to compose. Seated on a grassy bank by the roadside, he wrote, Your note of this date is but this moment, 11.50 a.m., received. I am, at this writing, about four miles west of Walker's Church, and will push forward to the front for the purpose of meeting you. Notice sent to me on this road where you wish the interview to take place will meet me. The man who had forced two previous Confederate armies to surrender at Fort Donelson and Vicksburg now allowed the man who would surrender to pick the time and place. Yes, the four-year play was nearing its end. A ceasefire was ordered, but the word would take time to reach men in both armies who were scattered across the landscape. And because of that, there would be confusion and needless, tragic loss of life. For example, Lieutenant Hiram Clark of the 185th New York was killed by Confederate fire. And there was Private William Montgomery of the 155th Pennsylvania, mortally wounded by Confederate artillery fire. He was only 15. And there was more fire, in this instance, verbal. During the exchange of notes between Lee and Grant, a slender, long-haired officer rode into Gordon's Confederate camp, and after a saber salute announced, I am General Custer and bear a message to you from General Sheridan. The general desires me to present to you his compliments and to demand the immediate surrender of all the troops under your command. Since Lee and Grant were already exchanging messages, this was a serious breach of military etiquette, and Gordon curtly rejected Custer's demand. That prompted Custer to say that Sheridan was prepared to annihilate your command in an hour. 
Gordon responded that in that case, Sheridan would have to bear responsibility for breaking a declared truce, and he had nothing further to say. Undaunted, Custer now wanted to see First Corps Commander Longstreet. The brash Custer's meeting with Longstreet was the stormiest of the day, for old Pete was in no mood for dandies and theatrics. Staring as the 25-year-old officer galloped up with blonde curls bouncing, Custer, in a sharp, agitated manner, addressed Lee's senior corps commander. In the name of General Sheridan, I demand the unconditional surrender of this army. Longstreet blew up like a powder keg. He reminded Custer that he was not the commander of the army, that Custer was within the lines of the enemy without authority, addressing a superior officer and in disrespect to General Grant as well as himself. Custer then replied that Longstreet would be responsible for the bloodshed to follow, and Longstreet shot back, go ahead and have all the bloodshed you want. Custer withdrew. Meanwhile, Grant's latest communication reached Lee and Longstreet. Both were seated under an apple tree. Message read, Lee prepared for the next step. Longstreet said quietly, General, unless he offers us honorable terms, come back and let us fight it out. The man in gray rode west with Grant's staff officer, Lieutenant Colonel Orville E. Babcock, to meet the federal commander. He also sent Lieutenant Colonel Charles Marshall of his staff to ride ahead and arrange a meeting place. And so, two men rushed to fulfill their destinies. The two generals headed for a way station on the Richmond-Lynchburg Stage Road, a little town of maybe 20 structures, two dirt streets. It was a place with a harsh Indian name, Appomattox. As Civil War author Bruce Catton so beautifully wrote, Appomattox was about to become one of the precious, haunted possessions of the American people. And if events seemed to understand that reckoning, of all the places to meet, they selected the home of one whose home was threatened four years earlier, in July of 1861, when he lived near a place called Manassas, and who decided after the fighting there to move to a spot where, as he put it, the war would never find him. And yet it did, in the home of Wilmer McLean. And of all the places in his home, they decided... How American to meet in his parlor. What better place for two to gather, to talk, to make peace? The process began in the early afternoon of April the 9th, Palm Sunday. The setting, one of the great scenes in American history. Inside, Lee waited. At about 1.30 p.m., he heard horses outside. Into the room walked the 43-year-old warrior in blue. Without sword and with rank stitched on the muddy coat of a private, he had one button buttoned wrong, and his boots and trousers were splattered with mud. Before him, Lee, at 58, tall, gray, handsome. On this day, he had on his best uniform. At his side, the jewel-studded hilt of a sword given to him by admirers from England. Again, from the powerful prose of Catton, Though neither could have possibly realized it then, their actions this day meant a portion of American history was about to end, and another would begin. A watershed moment in American history where sunset and sunrise would come together in one streaked glow that was half twilight and half dawn. When America of the past greeted a nation about to turn the page to a complex new future. And the two, Lee and Grant, symbolized the two worlds that this great and terrible civil war had forced to collide. Again, as Catton so beautifully presented, the Immaculate Lee bore an air of benevolent aristocracy, of a class that came from the past and looked to the past. It conjured up images of founding fathers of knee breeches, buckled shoes, and powdered wigs, a time of leisure dignity and a rigid code in which privilege and duty were clearly joined. That time and air had brought the country to its birth and provided many of its beliefs from America. It was destined to be a country of constant change, and the American Civil War made certain that it would be so. The dawning of the Industrial Age meant the leisure class would be diluted. War and modern machinery unhinged the aristocracy and its underling, slavery. 
Dignity now resembled arrogance. Pride of purse had begun to elbow away pride of breeding, and in the muddy, disheveled appearance of U.S. Grant, there was a glimpse of this new society, of this new age. It was one not dreamed of by the Founding Fathers. Here, the form of U.S. Grant was the representation of a new society with a lid taken off, Western man standing up to assert himself, to state that whatever lay back of a person mattered little with what lay ahead. One of many who refused to be handcuffed by the past, and though it and he may have looked rough and uncultivated, they could now come to important meetings wearing muddy boots and no sword, and yet they had to be listened to. Yes, there in McLean's parlor, two men, two societies. Once together, they shook hands and sat at two tables, about eight feet apart. Once they settled, the healing began. The victor was the one most visibly uncomfortable. Indeed, Grant related with the extreme disappointment and sadness that draped heavily round Lee's shoulders. For until only recently, Grant's very existence walked hand in hand with disappointment, with sadness. Perhaps he thought back to September 1853, stationed at far-removed Fort Humboldt, California. He was so lonely he devised schemes to make extra money so that he might bring the family out west to be with him. But fate was cruel. He bought 100 tons of ice bound for San Francisco. That shipment was delayed, and he missed the market. He bought cattle, hogs, and horses in hopes to sell. The plan failed. He planted potatoes and hoped to sell them. His fields flooded. He put up money with a merchant to open a store in San Francisco. His partner ran off with his money. He bought pigs for another entrepreneurial investment. It failed. He bought chickens to sell. They died in transit. He put up money for a billiards room in San Francisco, and yet another failure. The seven failures turned his loneliness into a disease, if you will. Alone, without his loved ones, he became depressed and turned to strong drink. On April the 11th, 1854, Lieutenant Colonel Robert Buchanan found him drunk on duty, and for all practical purposes, his 15-year military career was over. At the time of his resignation, he was so broke that money was loaned and some raised simply to get him back home. Back with his wife and two children, he was 32 years old with no money, no trade, no future. He and his family took up residence just outside of St. Louis, where he cut wood for $4 a cord. He appropriately named the place Hard Scrabble. Once he wondered aloud, is this my destiny? It seemed to be, for in 1856 he had less than $50 a year to spend for clothing for his wife and by now three children. In 1858 it was so bad that Grant put up prized personal mementos for auction. He relocated to St. Louis where he failed at real estate and missed a chance to be the superintendent of county roads. He thought he found work in the St. Louis Customs House, but the man who offered the position died, and his successor hired another. He hit rock bottom when his own father refused to loan him money for a venture out west. In 1860, U.S. Grant was 38 and a beaten man. And then came secession and a roundabout entrance into the war. Even then, after he gave the Union its first great major victories of the war at Fort Henry and Donelson, twice, twice he almost lost his command thanks to petty jealousy. Yes, U.S. Grant knew what it was like to feel disheartened, broken. And now he looked across the parlor at another man whose world had just crashed round him, at a man who, despite his name and family, also knew troubled times. A man who never really had a father, who patiently tended to his mother, then wife, when health failed them both, who in the last days of the Civil War had become the human epitome for why his men continued to fight, to stay in the field. In the final months, he thought about surrender, but then dismissed it 
when he mused aloud, but what would the country think? Former Virginia Governor John Wise exploded, Sir, you are the country to these men. Robert Edward Lee, then and now, a classic study for military leadership, one who led by example, who led in such fashion that his men fought and endured because they did not want to disappoint him. The man who, to repeat, the morning of the ninth listened while some suggested his army should take to the hills, conduct guerrilla operations which would have created havoc, hatred, and destruction for generations. But in his finest hour, Lee simply would not have it. The Almighty had had his say, and now it was time for soldiers to be good citizens. Two men, who on the surface seemed to be worlds apart, yet were cut from similar cloth. They understood the isolation of command. They understood defeat, anxiety, and disappointment. And there they sat, uncomfortably, awkwardly, in Wilmer McLean's parlor. It was Grant who attempted to break the ice. I met you once before, General Lee, while we were serving in Mexico, when you came over from General Scott's headquarters to visit Garland's brigade to which I belonged. I have always remembered your appearance, and I think I should have recognized you anywhere. Lee answered, Yes, I know I met you on that occasion, and I have thought of it, and tried to recollect how you looked, but I have never been able to recall a single feature. Then came a short pause, an awkward one. Grant again reminisced, and there was friendly though restrained conversation until Lee interrupted. In 36 years of military service, the man skilled in all phases of the military art now ventured into an area absolutely foreign to him. Surrender. I suppose, General Grant, that the object of our present meeting is fully understood. I asked to see you to ascertain upon what terms you would receive the surrender of my army. Grant lit a cigar, called for his order book. And the words flowed as he wrote out the terms and then personally handed his order book to Lee. The Confederate chieftain now made quite a show. He moved aside some books and the two brass candlesticks on the marble table. He fidgeted. He pulled his steel-rimmed spectacles from a pocket, withdrew a handkerchief, and cleaned them. He shifted again, crossed his legs, and adjusted his glasses. Officers and men were to be paroled. Arms, artillery, and war materiel were to be stacked. Officers would be allowed to retain their sidearms, horses, and baggage. And then the last line, and it was a powerful one. This done, each officer and man will be allowed to return to his home, not to be disturbed by the United States authorities so long as they observe their paroles and the laws in force where they may reside. And then the signature, U.S. Grant. Lee read the two pages. He had the word exchange added. Finishing, his expression for the first time brightened. And he said, this will have a very happy effect on my army. Grant then prepared to make a copy. As he did, Lee brought up a matter about horses. Thinking of his common soldiers who were mostly farmers, Lee asked, I should like to understand whether these men will be permitted to retain their horses. Grant answered, You will find that the terms as written do not allow this. Only the officers are permitted to take their private property. Lee's reaction showed concern about the matter, and Grant immediately remedied. He would not change the terms, but would instruct officers who received the paroles to allow men who claimed horses or mules to take them home. This done, Lee said, This will have the best possible effect on the men. A member of Grant's staff, Colonel Eli Parker, was asked to make a copy in ink. He had none. No one in Union Blue did. Lee's aide, Lieutenant Colonel Charles Marshall, supplied it. While Parker worked, Marshall ready to prepare a letter of acceptance. He had no paper. A Union officer supplied that. While the two worked, Grant introduced everyone in the room. And the story is told that when Lee shook Parker's hand, a full-blooded Seneca Indian, Lee studied his face and remarked, I am glad to see one real American here.
Parker supposedly answered, We are all Americans. Lee now mentioned he held a thousand or more Union prisoners and was concerned about not only feeding them, but his own men. Grant again immediately rose to the occasion. He turned to his chief commissary officer and asked for 25,000 rations to be distributed amongst the Confederates. The two copies were signed, and a little after 4 p.m., Lee shook hands once again with Grant, bowed to the others in the room, and made his way to the porch. All quietly followed. Standing on the lowest step, he waited for his horse, Traveler, to be bridled. With crimson face, he placed his felt hat on his head and pulled on his gloves. He stared off toward the valley where his army waited, now an army of prisoners. With what seemed like a sigh, he balled his fist and three times struck the palm of his other hand. As he mounted, Grant moved down the stairs and lifted his hat in salute. All the other Union officers followed suit. As Lee moved away, he and Grant's eyes met once more. Both lifted their hats. Two warrior generals now moved to turn their armies into citizens, into countrymen again. Inside that parlor, Grant, the warrior, had been a peacemaker. It was his finest hour. For Lee, he now faced his most difficult task. He had to tell his men. In an open field, they began to drift toward him. Rumors were rife. Singly, in clots, with tears streaming down many faces, they tried to wrestle with what they believed had just happened to him. To them. Finally, he tried to answer the repeated question, General, are we surrendered? His iron control broken, he said in a voice choked with emotion, Men, we have fought through the war together. I have done the best I could for you. My heart is too full to say more. And then slowly, carefully, he pushed his way through and rode back to his tent. The next day, Monday the 10th, Robert E. Lee tried to find the words he could not the day before say. To the some 25,000 men of the Army of Northern Virginia, he wrote, After four years of arduous service, Marked by unsurpassed courage and fortitude, the Army of Northern Virginia has been compelled to yield to overwhelming numbers and resources. I need not tell the survivors of so many hard-fought battles who have remained steadfast to the last that I have consented to this result from no distrust of them, but feeling that valor and devotion could accomplish nothing that could compensate for the loss that would attend the continuation of the contest I have determined to avoid the useless sacrifice of those whose past services have endeared them to their countrymen. By the terms of the agreement, officers and men can return to their homes and remain there until exchanged. You will take with you the satisfaction that proceeds from the consciousness of duty faithfully performed, and I earnestly pray that a merciful God will extend to you His blessings and protection. With an unceasing admiration of your constancy and devotion to your country, and a grateful remembrance of your kind and generous consideration of myself, I bid you all an affectionate farewell. For the victor, around 4.30 that Sunday afternoon of the 9th, Grant reined up his mount and took a seat on a large stone by the side of the road. He wrote to Secretary of War Edwin Stanton, General Lee surrendered the Army of Northern Virginia this afternoon on terms proposed by myself. That was it. No trumpeting or glorifying. Simple, direct, to the point. And Grant's compassion continued. Union Peace Commissioners Generals Charles Griffin and John Gibbon informed Brevet Major General Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain that Grant wanted him to receive the Confederate infantry surrender. Grant knew his man. Chamberlain would handle the ceremony with humility, with dignity. On April the 12th, four years to the day after the American Civil War began and the day after Lee's artillery had surrendered, Chamberlain proved himself worthy of Grant's appointment. Befitting the mood of the Confederate Army, the day was gray. 
In a drizzle under leaden skies, Chamberlain's men of the Union Fifth Corps lined the Richmond Lynchburg Stage Road. They stood at order arms, and then off to the right, there was a rustle. Men approached from down in the valley, out of the fog, like gray ghosts, the remnants of the Army of Northern Virginia. They were to pass silently, lay down their arms, and then to history become ghosts again. They were led by Major General John B. Gordon, who approached on horseback with head down. As he neared Chamberlain, there was a bugle, and Chamberlain's line snapped to attention. Then from regiment after regiment, the rattle of flesh on metal and wood as Chamberlain ordered rifles to be shifted to carry arms. The common soldier's salute to another common soldier. Gordon, though surprised, responded. His rearing horse and he became one. As his horse settled, Gordon drew his sword and dropped the tip of it to the toe of his boot. It was, as he put it, honor answering honor. Chamberlain movingly wrote much later, On our part not a sound of trumpet more, nor roll of drum, not a cheer, nor word nor whisper of vain glorying, nor motion of man standing again at the order, but an awed stillness, rather, and breath-holding, as if it were the passing of the dead. Indeed, it was the passing of an era, this stillness at Appomattox. Down the blue cordon, Lee's infantry marched, then division at a time, they turned in dress lines. Only twelve feet separated victor and vanquished. Arms and cartridge boxes were stacked. When it came time to give up battle flags, tears flowed, not only from heartbroken Confederates, but from those in blue who watched them. Chamberlain added, How could we help falling on our knees, all of us together, and praying God to pity and forgive us all? For all, one final march remained, the one for home. The respect those two armies shared for one another came in great part because of the leadership and respect Lee and Grant had shown one another. Soon thereafter, Grant returned to his mother's home near Cincinnati. As he entered and addressed her, his mother, Hannah, said dryly, Well, Ulysses, you've become a great man, haven't you? And went right back to work. Indeed, he had become a great man. Lee returned to Richmond. There he learned a federal grand jury sitting in Norfolk had indicted him for treason. Perplexed, he wrote Grant. From the terms at Appomattox, we're not all free from molestation. Grant believed so. But the 17th president, Andrew Johnson, begged to differ. In fact, Johnson asked, when can these men be tried? And Grant answered, never. Never unless they violate their paroles. The comment brought about a nasty exchange. I would like to know by what right a military commander interferes to protect an arch traitor from the laws. Steely Grant answered, I have made certain terms with Lee, the best and only terms. I will resign my command of the army rather than execute any order directing me to arrest him. Nothing else was ever done. Because two men, one victorious in muddy blue, the other vanquished in Confederate gray, shared a mutual respect that rose far beyond what any politician could ever understand. These two warriors, respected adversaries, these two Americans simply wanted their men, their common soldiers, to go home with dignity, with honor, and be one again. From their finest hour inside that parlor at Appomattox, and in their examples afterwards, Honor reigned supreme. Would to God that every man and woman who today calls themselves a leader or to extend that thought to every person who calls themselves a human being would all, like Lee and Grant, allow honor to reign supreme. Then perhaps all conflicts between nations and peoples, all civil wars that rage within oneself, might also find their own stillness might find a peace that reigned on a Palm Sunday 153 years ago 
when two Americans shared their finest hour. That Sunday, April the 9th, was not the only Confederate surrender. There would be three more. But the largest, the greatest number of Confederate troops to be surrendered at one site came April the 26th, and it occurred at the Bennett Place, Durham Station, North Carolina. Only a few miles from the campus of Duke University, it deserves our attention, and yes, even a visit perhaps, for it too, like Appomattox, is another place where stillness and peace reigned, when yet again, time stood still. I have walked the hallowed grounds of almost every major battlefield of the American Civil War. At each, there is a disturbed, troubled energy. Not so at Appomattox. Rather, there is an air of letting go, of laying down, and a stillness that Bruce Catton noted in the title of his Pulitzer Prize winning history. From that pastoral and peaceful setting, this has been the story of Lee and Grant, who there, on Palm Sunday, 1865, made it so. This is Fred Kiger. Thank you for listening. <laughs>